Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining our Stroud Water webinar today. My name is Kimberly, and I am in the Portland, Maine office. We also have offices in Atlanta and Nashville. Today's webinar will be recorded, and I will be sending you that recording as well as the presentation materials after the event. Before we get started today, I wanted to let you know a little bit more about our firm. We're a leading national healthcare consulting firm, and we serve healthcare clients exclusively. We focus on strategic, operational, and financial areas where our perspective offers the highest value. We're proud of our 34-year track record with rural hospitals, community hospitals, healthcare systems, and large physician groups. Now on to today's speaker. Cynthia Wicks has more than three decades of healthcare industry experience within national managed care organizations, health insurance companies, ACOs, physician IPAs, and hospital system organizations. She has a strong balance of analytical expertise and matrix management abilities providing leadership to businesses undergoing startup, rapid growth, or major transformation, and is able to work with boards, board-level committees, and executives to provide vision and establish strategy. Cindy also leads our population health team here at Stroudwater. With that, um, if you have any questions, please use the chat function, and we will save some time at the end to get to your questions. With that, I will turn it over to Cindy Wicks. Thank you, Kimberly. And welcome everyone to today's webinar. The agenda for this afternoon is threefold, really primarily to give you an overview of some of the new MS models that have been recently announced on April 22nd, uh, and then also uh, discuss a little bit of what to watch for out over the next several weeks and months as we uh, move forward through those model processes, and then things to consider while you're setting your overall strategy. So first, I'm going to take a few minutes to review recent CMS innovations. But before I do that, I'd like to ask a poll question. Um, have any of you seen the CMS webinars, either the primary care first or the direct contracting webinars? That'll help me focus my, uh, my comments this afternoon. Okay, I've got the poll open, Cindy. Um, and you can select one, both, or neither. We'll give everyone a few moments to put down their sandwiches and their coffee and their Diet Cokes. Give us your opinion. So far, it looks like almost 90% haven't seen either one of the recent CMS webinars. And we'll give you a few more seconds, and then we will close out the poll and share the results with you. Yeah, 91%, Cindy, haven't seen either one. I guess it was just you. All right, there we go. Well, then, we are going to dive into these models that were just announced on April 22nd by CMS. Um, the, the following slides that you're going to see were a lot of materials from CMS. I happened to be in Baltimore the week these, these were announced. There were high-level representatives from CMS there discussing these models with our, our group um, that was in Baltimore. So it's a compilation of some of those notes and some of the uh, webinar materials that they have been presenting over the last several weeks. So with that, let me talk about these models. Uh, CMS has rolled out what they're calling Primary Cares Initiative to transform primary care through value-based options and to test financial risk and performance-based payment for primary care providers. They're doing this with two different tracks. One's called Primary Care First. The other is called Direct Contracting. Primary Care First then breaks down even further into two model options, one called General and the other for High Needs Populations. The Direct Contracting track takes you down into three different options, Direct Contracting Professional, Global, and Geographic. And so as we go through the next hour together, we're going to be talking about more uh, what we do know about these models that have, have been released. So we'll start with Primary Care First. And the next several slides are going to be specifically or more aligned to talking about the, um, uh, the general option, and then we'll talk about the special need population. These are five-year payment model options. Unlike some of the things we've seen in the past that were three years, these are moving to five-year, as we've seen on the MSSP options recently as well. 
the underlying principle of primary care first is, is really building on the underlying principles existing in the CPC plus models that are already out there. So you're going to see a lot of commonality with those as well as where they're being offered. CMS is also going to be encouraging payers, whether they're Medicare Advantage plans, commercial carriers, Medicaid programs, to also um, take a look and apply for these over the summer and whether or not they'd open up and support these options in their in these locations. So a little bit deeper dive into this model. Uh, for me, this is a looks like a hybrid model. Um, it has a capitation risk-based payment along with a flat primary care fee embedded in it. And then there's an opportunity to enhance reimbursement by up to 50% based on performance. There is a small downside risk to this model of 10% which we'll see as we dive a little deeper into this. Uh, the uh, capitation payment incentivizes proactive team outreach, obviously, and uh, incentivizes non-visit, non-traditional uh, visit care options like telemedicine, uh, email communications, et cetera, with our, with our patients. <clears throat> First, who can participate in these models? Uh, this is directly from CMS. They're looking for primary care practices with advanced primary care capabilities and that are willing to accept some increased financial risk in these models. Because like I said, there's a capitation piece to this and there is a little downside risk. You have to be located in one of the selected primary care first regions, which I'll show you in a moment. You have to be a primary care uh, practice uh, with a minimum of 125 attributed Medicare beneficiaries at each particular location. Then in addition to that, primary care services accounts for about 70% of the practice's collective billing based on revenue. If you are in a multi-specialty practice, it's 70% of the practice's eligible primary care practitioners combined revenue that would count towards this calculation. And as you can see here without reading the other things, you also have to um, be um, somewhat familiar, obviously, with taking value paste, be involved in value paste uh, reimbursement models. Um, have electronic medical record capability, 24-7 access to the patients, and obviously um, be willing to meet the other requirements. So if we take a look at the regions, for those of you who are familiar or you may be a CPC plus um, practice right now, it is in those same locations plus CMS has added these locations. This is the total list of locations. We have to call them regions, as you can see. Most are statewide, but there are several that are just regions within larger states. So be very careful and pay attention to the regions you're in as to whether or not you can even apply for this particular model. So diving into a little bit of the payment structure a little bit on primary care first, this is the payment structure specifically for the general uh, option, not the special needs option. So for the primary care payment, breaks down into two pieces, the professional population-based care payment and then the flat visit fee. And then on addition to that, there's the performance-based adjustment. So we're going to take a little bit deeper dive into each one of these. And you can see some of this is right from, from CMS at this point. Um, this hybrid model, um, if we start first with a professional population-based payment, this is for services in or outside the office adjusted for practices caring for higher risk populations. This payment is the same for all patients within a practice. The payments are adjusted to account for beneficiaries seeking services outside the practice. Our best interpretation of this at this point is, is that CMS will use kind of a, 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 comp a composition of your entire C uh, Medicare population in terms of their risk scores and will bucket the practices into either groups one through five, low to highest risk. You can then see how the payments adjust per beneficiary per month. So this is a capitation per month that you'd get. And depending on where your practice lands and which group, you get that dollar amount for each one of the beneficiaries. The second part of this payment is a flat fee of $50. And it doesn't matter where you're located at this point. Um, they haven't adjusted that. Um, they may change that, but they haven't at this point. And it is obviously $50 for each face-to-face -face patient encounter. To get to the performance-based payment adjustments, um, again, five-year, remember this is a five-year deal, and in year one through five, the adjustments are based on the acute hospital utilization, but in year one, that's the only criteria you have. 
For years two and five, though, the adjustment-based performance is described below. So first, it's going to be a, a gateway that you've got to get through. Did the practice exceed that quality gateway? If the answer is no, if you didn't do at least the minimum that they put out there, that's where that negative 10% adjustment to the total primary care payment would, would take place. Assuming that you get through that quality gateway and the answer is yes, then you're eligible for up to 50% total primary care payment. And that's going to be determined on three different benchmarks, national adjustment, cohort adjustment, and continuous improvement adjustment. Um, I do not have uh, any information that I've seen right now. I've got questions out on the national adjustment, but I am going to address the, the cohort adjustment and the, and the improvement adjustment. The cohort adjustment is when you're going to be compared against the other participants in this model to determine the performance-based adjustment. So once you're uh, all lined up against other, your competitors in this, in this uh, particular model, if you were in the bottom 50% of those practices, you'll have zero adjustment, so there'll be no bonus. You don't have anything taken away at this point because you've made it through the gate, but you don't get anything either. If you were in the top 50% of the practices, then you can see here that they adjust depending on where you are in that ranking between 6.5% and 34%. In addition to that, you're also eligible for continuous improvement bonus of up to one-third of the total B, P, B, A amount. Um, so this is this is something also that um, we're waiting to hear a little bit more about as to how this is exactly going to be calculated. But the intent here is that CMS wanted to recognize and honor practices that were at least having um, improvement in their outcomes and their performance against these benchmarks. Um, and if you were in a continuous improvement mode, you can see here, depending on where that falls out in the criteria, there is there's another opportunity for an additional for additional funds. That's what we know right now as it relates to the general um, model. For the high needs population, similar in a lot of regards, but this is really going to focus on practices who are, are opting um, to handle a severely high um, needs population. You can even uh, partner with hospice and palliative care partners as, as part of your panel um, you know, for, for working with these patients. The payment structure is significantly more. I, I do have some questions out to CMS on this, but as of right now, uh, this is the information we have. In the first 12 months, there is a kind of a first-time payment for, for these patients, and then following monthly payments of, you can see, they're ranging in, um, in, in, in you know, two, three hundred dollars type of, of ranges. There's also a, a flat fee for that of fifty dollars and a quality payment, but more to come on that. The quality measures that are being used. Uh, that, you know, to get through that performance gate as well as to have the performance-based adjustment payments. You can see here, we talked about the acute hospital utilization measure. That will be utilized in years one through five, and it is the only thing that's going to count in year one. At least that's the information we have right now. And then starting in year two through five, these are the gateway uh, criteria that you would have to meet um, in order to make it through the gateway. And you can see a couple of these are starred, and also there's a caveat on this. If you are taking care of severely ill, seriously ill populations, or you end up, your practice ends up in risk group four or five, they're still determining which quality metrics to use for, for those populations. So more to come on that. And then in general, the comprehensive primary care functions that need to be in place for these models. CMS has identified these five more recently patient access and continuity, care management, so you've got to be able to do risk stratification and, and care management. Um, there's this coordination and integrated behavioral health and the, the uh, psychosocial needs addressed. There's also components for uh, patient and caregiver engagement and planned care and population health. So these are five major categories of functions at a practice that CMS will be monitoring. So I think it'll be really important to start reading the um, application that is supposed to come out soon. But here's what it's looking like from the, from the uh, payer partners. CMS during the summertime intends to reach out to all the payers in those same regions, whether they be Medicare Advantage, uh, Medicaid managed care plans, commercial plans, uh, even states and encourage them to adopt some of these same things to make it easier for primary care and further alignment of, of and, and similarities of these models to make it easier for everyone. 
timeline right now on this, this is tricky. Applications are opening up in the spring of 2019. Well, we are in spring, um, and the applications are still forthcoming. So one would hope we see those in the next couple of weeks. Um, the practice applications are due um, during the summertime and solicitations for the payers will, will overlap during that summer session. And then during the fall winter is when we would know who's selected to be in these models with a January 1, 2020 launch. Now I'll say this is the first cohort. Um, CMS is also saying that they intend to have another application period during 2020. Do not know when that will be, but if you do not make the January 1st, there may be another opportunity during 2020 to be involved in this model. So in summary for this model, you can see that you've got uh, base payments that are, are stratified by how um, your overall patient risk category you fall into from $24 to $175. You've got, um, again, CMS has not yet released the details as to the services and the CPT codes, et cetera, that are in part of those capitations. Um, so it's hard to model some of this right now. Um, and there's also the flat $50 face-to-face -face patient encounter and then up to 50%, again, as we just discussed, for, for bonus opportunity uh, based on where you come out on these different thresholds. So I'm going to pause there for another question before we move on to the next model. In which models, uh, if any, do you currently participate? MSSP, NextGen, do we have any CPC Plus folks on the folks, or others like bundles and that sort of thing, or are not, you're not involved in uh, these products yet? Okay, while you take a breath and a sip of water, we'll give people a moment to give their feedback. Right now, it looks like it's running 60% not participating in any of the models, 7% um, in Medicare Shared Savings Program, none in NextGen. We'll give people a few more seconds and fair warning that we're going to close out the poll in about five seconds. All right, we're going to close the poll and show the results. Here we go. We've got um, more than half of the um, respondents aren't participating in any of the models. CPC Plus at 6%, MSSP at 17%, NextGen is a goose egg, and other for 22%. All right, great. Thank you very much for, for sharing that with us. So it helps to know who's who's on the line today. So we're going to move on now to the direct contracting path. As I said before, these were also announced on April 22nd, and this is the second uh, branch that, that uh, for consideration. Very different than the first. Um, this is targeting a little bit larger um, ACO model, um, next-gen MSSPs. Maybe this may be a good alternative for you folks out there in those types of models. But again, this is a voluntary payment option that you can apply for. Um, it, it was modeled and based on some taking some pieces from MSSP and NextGen, as well as even Medicare Advantage. Um, and there are three options as discussed before, so we're going to go down through some of those now. The first one being professional, the second one being global, and then the geographic. The professional one is the, um, the lower risk sharing arrangement, but it's still at 50%, so it's still significant risk, but it's half and half. And then it is involving for a payment perspective, we'll offer primary capitation equal to 7% of the total cost of care for enhanced primary services. Uh, then you get into a, a global option, which is the highest risk, and that's 100% shared savings and losses. With two payment options, you can I'll still opt for the 7% on the primary care, or you can take full capitation, as it says here, risk-adjusted monthly payment for all services provided by DC participants and preferred providers with whom the DCE has an, an, an agreement. And I'm going to discuss that a little bit further because there's, there's two buckets of providers here. There's the DC participants and the preferred providers. And the geographic model is um, out for public input right now in terms of a request for information. There's not a lot about it. They're really looking for input on this. The deadline was originally midnight tonight. It has now been extended to the 30th of May. Um, so for those of you that are, are thinking of, of putting your two cents worth in here, you have uh, another week to do so um, through CMS's website. <clears throat> so for right now, 
what we do know is um, that one's still very much up in the air. But these models are very based off, like I said, they expect that the next gens and the MSSPs may be interested in putting this alongside, you know, as one of their options. They're also looking to kind of make sure that they can get other types of organizations attracted in that maybe not have participated before, such as uh, maybe providers that have only been in Medicare Advantage or, um, you know, Medicaid MCOs that are really, that have not really been participating yet in some of these models. Um, the other thing that's noteworthy on, on this particular, these particular options is there's an increasing amount for both benefit enhancements in these models as well as um, increasing beneficiary engagement and affordability and a little bit of voluntary alignment in this. So there's going to be more, you can see more, in, uh, you know, membership engagement in these models, I think. So let's talk about a little bit further on these. As I said, these are more aligned with some of the, the ACO models that have been out there. You've got to have at least 5,000 aligned Medicare beneficiaries for the professional or the global. Discussion was at the uh, conference I was at, 75,000 members for a geographic option. Again, I, I think that's very much up in the air at this point until um, CMS receives feedback from the public as to whether they go forward with this and what this looks like. And they're also, again, using this as an OMRAP on-ramp for organizations that may not have participated before. As we mentioned before, it mentioned two types of uh, practitioners here, the DC participants and the preferred providers. This model very much has kind of a core to it, and your DC participants are those of you that are actually putting in your application. You're, you're saying that you are responsible for the reporting of the quality and the total cost of care for these beneficiaries. Um, however, you can, um, you will be asked to probably um, name who your preferred providers are. In other words, these are the circle around you, your referral network and other uh, providers in the community that you may want to participate in downstream in this model. But again, you can see the different context here. So watch the language on this. If you were applying, you are a, you know, a, a DC participant and that's where the beneficiaries will be aligned to, even though you may have an extended network that you're going to set up agreements with. So in kind of a summary in terms of the payment options, you can see here you've only got one option if you're uh, opting for professional and that's that 7% cap. If it's global, you can opt for the 7% or total capitation on, on these services. Little noteworthy here, um, there's always a lot of controversy on, on a lot of these models with benchmarking methodology. Um, and there was a lot of conversation at the conference as I was at about this. Uh, very much wondering, you know, the Medicare Advantage plans have had a very different um, benchmarking methodology than our MSSPs and NextGens have. You will notice here, though, uh, where these things are starting to blend together. This is a blend of historical spending and adjusted Medicare Advantage regional expenditures are going to be used to develop the benchmarks for the direct contracting options. So, so there is kind of a movement here of, of things that are merging together slightly. In addition to that, there are a lot of benefit enhancements, as they said. This is one of the things that, that these models are very much focused on. Uh, the first set of these are, are very much like what you see in the next-gen model, three-day SNF uh, rule waiver, telehealth expansion waiver, post-discharge home rule waiver, and a care management waiver. Um, in addition to that, though, there, CMS is seriously considering expanding some of those additional waivers to include allowing nurse practitioners to certify that a patient's eligible for home health services and allowing provision of home health services to beneficiaries who are not uh, right now meeting the definition of homebound, which would be a huge advancement for, for delivering of home care services um, for those that don't meet that current criteria. So in summary on the direct contracting, the timeline is this. There's a letter of intent due to CMS by Friday, August 2nd. So if you have any inkling of wanting to, to take a look at this model, um, it is non-binding, uh, but it has to be there or you may not apply for this model. So I'm going to pause for the last question. Have you considered participating in or becoming a Medicare Advantage plan as part of your strategy? Okay, give everyone a moment to let their fingers and keyboards awaken. Quick yes or no on this. We've got about 25% of our attendees who voted. Give you a few more seconds to chime in here. And we'll close it out in about five seconds. 
Looks like we've got 70% no and 30% yes. And we're going to close out now. Share the results with everybody. 69% no and 31% yes. Great. Thanks, Kimberly. Um, the reason that I've added in a conversation here about Medicare Advantage, um, I have I've had years of experience in both Medicare Advantage and on the ACO side of things. And as I said, as you saw, what you're going to see here is kind of a merging of some of these things, I think. Uh, once you push out into some of the programs we just discussed, especially the direct contracting that's taking 100% risk, it's starting to feel and start to look like, you know, is Medicare Advantage another option? So I thought it was uh, noteworthy as well. There have been changes for the Medicare Advantage plans over the last several years, and more recently, uh, paying attention to what is going on with them as well. They are they are being advanced forward in their model, um, and so we're going to spend a few minutes discussing Medicare Advantage. Um, this slide is slightly behind because it stopped at 2017, and back in 2017, we already had a third of the uh, seniors in the country enrolled in a Medicare Advantage plan. And that has steadily increased since 2004, as you can see from this. There hasn't been a year that it hasn't, you know, upticked, um, you know, as we've gone forward into 2017. The forecast is, and it's even higher now, and the forecast is in the next couple of years, that's going to push 50%. So that is a very huge statistic to pay attention to, because obviously the other folks are in traditional Medicare and may be in some of your ACOs or, or just in traditional Medicare, depending on where you are in the country. But this is a trend that you really need to pay attention to as you're setting your strategy, and I think it's a pretty important one. The number of plans you can see have been increasing steadily since 2009 as well, and you see the, there was a blip back there, and it went down, and it's coming back up almost to that level again. Um, the number of plans doesn't you know, pr quite impress me as much as the uh, curve I showed you before with the participants increasing. This is also a reflection of mergers and, and things that are going on in the marketplace. This does not include PACE programs. It doesn't uh, handle the dual eligibles here. This is just the Medicare Advantage plans. Again, lots of different options in lots of different marketplaces. And how prevalent are they? Here's a map of the United States by county. Um, and you can see there is a lot of blues and oranges and less and less gray. And the gray areas have zero options for the membership there. But you can see most of the country now almost every senior has some alternative to traditional Medicare. Um, and that is hugely significant. This has changed dramatically over the last several years. And, and again, very much forecasting to be half the seniors in the next couple of years. <clears throat> Distribution-wise, uh, by this information, there's only about 1% right now of the population that doesn't have an option where they live. This is pretty significant change over the last several years. And on average, most Americans have got, seniors have got seven different choices out there, seven different firms that are offering Medicare Advantage. That's huge um, and, and pretty significant when you're setting your strategy, depending on what market you're in. And you may say, I'm in a market that doesn't have much of this going on. I'm not involved with it. And I am just suggesting that um, a good idea to know what is out and around you because Medicare Advantage plans are being incentivized to grow their membership and evolve in these same similar types of models. So we're going to talk about that. For example, Medicare Advantage, um, if folks are not familiar with the plans, they are required to offer all of the Medicare services that uh, traditional Medicare offers, but quite often they offer more. And if any of you have loved ones, seniors, uh, members in your family that have got a Medicare Advantage plan, then you will quite often see a larger uh, benefit design, lower co-pays, et cetera. So it tends to be a very attractive product for a senior. Um, and you can see that these are even additional supplemental benefits for 2019 that plans are, are going to be allowed to offer and are offering so that you can start to see they're getting creative in terms of pushing beyond the bounds of, of typical uh, what we would call normal medical care. You can see massage therapy on there. You can see um, support for families and caregivers. So we are talking about stretching beyond normal uh, benefit designs here. For 2020, Medicare Advantage, given the urgency and the scope for the national opioid epidemic in the United States, CMS is also 
making some changes for these plans as it relates to those services and issues as well, as you can see here. They are really going to change um, uh, pain management and complementary and integrative treatment for Medicare Advantage plans. So that's going to be something new. Access to opioid reversal agents. Um, so it's, it's CMS is strongly encouraging the Part D, and Part D is your um, um, drug benefit of Medicare Advantage. A lot of plans offer it as part of their Medicare Advantage plan, but uh, this is this is new also. And then you can see some of those factors coming into the star ratings. Star ratings for Medicare Advantage plans, that's how uh, the uh, Medicare plans are, are ranked, if you will. You'll see them have four stars, four and a half stars, five stars. That's the highest rating that a plan can have. So some of these things are going to be added into some of these uh, uh, measures for, for the Medicare Advantage plans. So they're being encouraged and pushed along as well. And then also, um, wanted to, to pause here and talk a little bit about the value-based insurance design model. You'll notice the word value-based insurance. Well, we've got value-based care. We've got the value-based models that we just discussed. And even the Medicare, um, you know, Medicare Advantage plans have got an option here that they can apply for. This started in 2017, I believe, the, the VBIDs. Um, there were a few health plans that opted into some of those things. This was an application process um, that was just completed recently. So we'll wait to see who, who has um, opted into which ones of these. But you will notice some similarities here. Value-based insurance design by condition, socioeconomic status, or both. This is something very new. Um, you know, historically, insurance plans, your benefit design stays the same. It's the same for everybody. This is suggesting that if you, if they were to opt into this model, they would be allowed to um, sort of kind of restratify the population um, and do some benefit design around uh, by these different factors, so that they are, that the benefit design is is fitting better the subpopulations. So this is new. Um, you can see also telehealth. We talked about telehealth as a waiver um, for next gens and the direct contracting. So you can see some similarities cropping up here as well, because now the uh, Medicare Advantage plans can also factor these into their um, uh, their services and their access to these services. Obviously, you still have to have face-to-face -face option available to their membership, but this is a new twist as well in terms of meeting their network requirements. That is huge. And then obviously pushing um, health and wellness types of things that'll be required for anybody that's participating in these. But again, I think I thought it was noteworthy that um, in addition to all of these new models that are coming out that, that feature for, for primary care, physicians, hospitals, health systems, ACOs that are going on, a very similar trend is happening with the Medicare Advantage plans that, um, and some of you are already participating in some of them. So if we kind of step back and say, okay, reading between the lines and some of these emerging patterns that, that we were just alluding to, certainly there's an increased competition with all these models out here. Um, and again, we'll really pay attention to both, I think, Medicare ad Advantage as well as these other options for the health systems. There are certainly some emerging characteristics that, as, that I just mentioned as we went through this. Um, CMS is lessons learned, taking a look at, uh, at the models that have come before and obviously combining some of the models and innovations on some of these new things they're rolling out. As we just discussed, if you're, if you're thinking about direct contracting, then you probably should also take a look at Medicare Advantage because uh, you're pushing over there into 100% risk. Um, and when you do, you, you start to look and act like a provider, a, a payer, I should say, um, you know, anything, for example, that used to be your, you know, your revenue centers become your cost centers because your revenue is now that premium dollar. And so there is a, a real um, parallel going on here, in my opinion, um, and one that's worth and noteworthy to pay attention to. Some of these models are overlapping. Um, you know, you say, gee, if I'm in one of these, what do I do about the others and can they be used in combination? This was a topic of conversation at the conference where I was at a few weeks ago. And CMS is taking a look at the overlapping uh, issue on these models, and I'm, I'm anxiously waiting to see if we if we see any guidance on this. Um, member engagement incentives. This is an increasing area on all of these models in terms of of, of, of membership and incentives that are being allowed for these populations. And then we see population specific models. For example, right, the primary care 
Uh, first has one for you know your high need patients, uh, seriously ill patients. Then we see over on the Medicare Advantage side of things that oh there are options that they may be able to start doing ben different benefit designs for some of those subpopulations based on certain criteria. So I think we're going to start to see a little bit more of this um, running parallel with taking care of the overall population, but very specific populations and models as well. And then there's all the waivers and inclusions, inclusion of non-traditional services. I think this is going to be a huge shift. Uh, there have been many studies showing that some of the non-traditional services are having huge ROIs. You know, putting up the grab bars in, in people's homes and paying a handyman to do that is paying for itself tenfold um, in terms of, of uh, you know, lessening the risk of falls, et cetera. So there's definitely evidence and research out there showing that mm, it may be worth paying and making this literally part of the benefit design. Um, Medicare Advantage has been doing this a little bit. They certainly offer health services and part of their benefits. They may say, hey, you've got $400, go buy, you know, exercise equipment for your home. Um, but we will start to see, I think, more of these non-traditional services offered. So things to watch if you're looking at what CMS models are out there, and you know we haven't touched on what maybe some of the commercial carriers are doing, but the things to watch for coming up. Make sure you're watching for when, when due dates are for either filing of applications for things or submitting letters of intent. Um, important to do so. Um, they're non-binding, so if you choose not to do them later on, but it's certainly, uh, these are coming fast and furious. We're sitting here, obviously, on the, the cusp of the end of May, and already we are seeing all of these uh, activities that have to happen in the spring, the summer, and August. So then we also want to watch uh, for the, well, as I said, I'm watching for CMS if they put any guidelines on these overlapping models, uh, what will be allowed and what won't be allowed. Um, Watch for details on the benchmarking and attribution methodologies. These are huge. They have um, caused angst in some of our prior models, uh, but we are certainly seeing a blending of activities here. Also, watch for the details on the services and codes included in any capitation rates. This is huge. Um, I have not seen the you know devils in the details. Hard to tell with any of those rates in primary care first are good or bad um, without knowing the services that they are covering. And also, obviously, um, very important to know uh, which category of practice you'd be in, in terms of your risk of your group and population, whether you're a one or a five, in terms of the, the population you currently handle in your practices, if you're a physician practice. Watch for CMS changes to claims and encounter filing requirements. I think we'll see some of this, too, as these capitation um, payments come into to view here. It changes uh, what probably information they're going to want to have. Um, and receive from all of us. And then watch for the available waiver options. That'll be huge in terms of giving the most flexibility in these models. So strategies to consider. Certainly in incentive, um, you know, incentive redesign and alignment are going to be key. And what do I mean by that? Um, as you move forward into these more complex models, really really have to pay attention to the physician and staff incentive alignment on these reimbursement models because it's a very different structure and incentive to, to work in a fee-for-service environment versus full capitation and actually flipping all, almost over to uh, becoming a payer of these things. And again, like I said before, your current revenue centers are, are starting to push into to cost center mode as opposed to, as opposed to revenue. In addition to that, uh, maturity of your population health management processes will matter greatly in this. So if you don't have a good foundation, you're going to want to put that in place, uh, take a look at your care management um, models that you have in place, your transitions of care models that you've got going. But this is going to be a, a, a huge piece, uh, you know, whether you've got post-acute care um, services in place um, and strategies around these types of things. So pay attention to those. If you've not paid attention in the past um, to the HCC score, now this is your score that ranks the uh, severity of your population. It gives you that risk score. All of these models are very much, your payment of these are very much based on what your risk score of your population is. Ideally, you'd want to do that before you enter into some of these models because that's how you're going to get your highest value payment on, on these uh, particular models that are being put out. So I can't emphasize this one enough. Um, not enough time is always spent on this, and, and it's pretty foundational, as you can see, on these reimbursement models. 
and analyze any capitation arrangements very carefully. I really I like to put those up against the codes, the services that are included, and, and do your modeling to see if they work for you and your, um, uh, your location in the country. And then understand the benchmarks, as I said before, and how they're going to impact you. You may want to consider multiple models. There may be, under certain circumstances, strategies where this works. I've talked to organizations out there in marketplaces where they are working with multiple models. Um, and even if you don't apply for a particular model, there may be some lesson learned or things that you can use within your accountable care organization um, for better alignment. So some of these models are all noteworthy to take a look at. And then I like to analyze all the options. If I'm in a geography um, that, that's offering primary care first or, or whatever models that are available to me, know your marketplace. I can't emphasize this enough before you decide your strategic options. Don't disregard. You've got to pay attention to Medicare Advantage. Um, know what the commercial payers in your marketplace are doing, the products that are out there. You know, you'll all have health insurance parties through your employers. Take a look at those product designs. Are there others in your area that are doing um, contracting and value-based contracting? That will give you a signal as to what's going on and which payers may be good partners in the future. Um, state Medicaid. We've got a lot of states, obviously, moving into alternative payment models, um, disrupt dollars being used on some of these models. So pay attention to that as well. There may be opportunities there. And then I can't emphasize enough, if uh, setting strategies, I'd like to look around the local and regional ACOs and associated networks and who's in those, because at some point you may need to decide whether you're going this solo or if you're in a position where you'd like to affiliate with a larger network or accountable care organization or some combination of those uh, in order to, to do this work. There's certainly some um, niceties of uh, you know, economies of scale as it relates to your infrastructure. But in addition to that, um, if you're competing in a very heavy Medicare Advantage marketplace, they are very cognizant about having what I call a marketable network, because obviously you want to have the services and providers available um, if, you're, if you're going to productize any of this. So as you're pushing into these more advanced models, if you decide to do this, please pay attention to your, all these things in terms of your strategy um, considerations. They're all pretty important. And I am going to pause at this point. We've spent about 45 minutes going through some of the models. Um, I'll catch my breath if there are any questions. Otherwise, what I will do, I will say this. CMS is, is saying that they're going to have um, their slide decks out soon, uh, more information and detail on their websites. So pay attention to those locations as well as the Stroudwater um, website. As we get more information, I, I was on the phone with some of the CMS people this morning. As soon as we get more information or uh, more details around some of what we've discussed this afternoon, uh, we'll be sharing that um, through, through our different vehicles of, of communication with you folks out there. So there's more to come, certainly. We don't know a lot about these models, so there's probably a lot of questions I won't be able to answer because CMS has not answered them. But um, like I said, stay tuned. And uh, definitely these are some good options if you're primary care and um, if you're a next gen or an MSP trying to make decisions as to what the next model might look like, certainly should pay attention to the direct contracting options. I'll stop there, Kimberly, and see if anybody has um, sure. asked any questions that we might be able to answer today. Otherwise, we will, we will send out information as we get it. We have a couple questions that will probably um, have pertinence to a large swath of the uh, registrants. One is about this super tight timing. We've got, what, about seven months before 2020, if you can believe that. Um, what's your sense, understanding that everything's still in play, about when the final guidance will come down from CMS? Mm -hmm. Yeah, to the best of my knowledge at this point, for primary care first, those applications should be accessible <laughs> hopefully within the next couple of weeks. Um, how egregious they are to fill out and get in uh, in the timeline that they've asked for, don't know. Um, I should say this, any of you that are currently CPC plus organizations are eligible to look at these models. Um, and since you've been through the process once, maybe it's an easier lift for some of you folks and somebody just setting their strategy. As I said before, there will be, CMS is saying, there will be a second uh, cohort uh, application process in 2020. 
So if the pressure is too tight, um, that's something you're going to have to make a decision on, whether you can get this done this fast and are ready to grab onto this model on January 1, or if you need a few more months, I'd be looking for what they're going to put out there as the second cohort. Okay. And our last question today was um, around the HCC coding. Um, you called special attention to that and said if you've never paid attention before, now mm -hmm. is the time. Can you speak a little bit more about that? Um, sure. Uh, for those of you that have been in accountable care organizations, uh, you may maybe have heard that term before, but this is uh, diagnostic coding. This is, goes on information that goes on every claim, if you will, and basically it is just building the truth out of the, um, uh, your physician notes in terms of all of the, the diseases that a particular member has, the patient has, um, and the diagnoses that they have. Um, this information needs to be captured and should be reported on the claims. Uh, I watch both billing systems because sometimes they truncate things, um, even though we've done good documentation. Uh, but that is the only communication tool a provider has right now with CMS and other payers as to the severity and the, the, the level of sickness of these patients. In addition to that, CMS does not keep the historical information. So as frustrating as this is, this has to be documented every single year because uh, whether we like it or not, unfortunately, these diseases seem to disappear between year one and year two, and you have to redocument them, otherwise they do not exist. Um, so that you can, so what they do is they'll take those risk scores and those risk scores then determine what level of payment and reimbursement you get for the total cost of care. And you saw that group one through five uh, for primary care first, $24. At the lowest risk level, $175 per patient per month, per member per month um, at the highest risk level. Those scores will be used to determine which bucket you end up in. They are pretty significant. Um, if those of you are on the, that are out there today participate in Medicare Advantage, you have probably been pinged by your payers many times over the years to have access to some of your files and data because Medicare Advantage plans for years have been able to go in, grab that additional information, send it into CMS to prove that their membership is sicker, and get additional reimbursement in terms of premiums from Medicare. So hopefully that answers the question. But there's a lot of information out there um, in the universe about these, these scorings, and we can certainly be glad to answer questions in more detail um, if somebody wants to. All right, let me see if we've got... Another one here, uh, let's see. Um, is there a website that we can seek out to get our clinic HCC? So is there a way, is there like some repository for getting that information? Um, none that I know of, I, I, and this is part of why I said watch the detail. Um, I'm waiting to see what the application says about if they've got any more detail about how they're going to go about this and what categories are going to make somebody a group one, a group two, a group three, a group four, or a group five. Very unclear how that's going to, to, to bucket out. Um, at, I do not know of a repository where that's not something that's, that's readily accessible. Okay, thank you. I think that's it for our questions. Um, I will be sending the audio portion of this as well as the printed materials. And then on that very first page, um, if you have a question for Cindy, you'll see her email and her direct dial information. Um, so we thank you so much for giving us a little time. We'll credit a few minutes back to your account today. Um, and on behalf of my colleagues in Portland, Maine, and Atlanta, and Nashville, I thank you so much for spending a little time with us today.